Uh, so this is our first agape latte of um, fall 2016. So we really, 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 really appreciate um, that everyone can make it out. Um, and we've kind of moved from last year since I was back to Some of you might have been to agape latte events. Um, last year they were actually uh, Bill Grill, Bill Club Grill, Grill um, which especially last year when they had the, you know, calling out the orders over the intercom, which wasn't great for acoustics. Um, and lighting and everything. So we think this room's a little bit brighter, um, a little bit more, you know, open and sitting and everything. So um, we're excited. But anyways, uh, thanks again for coming out. And <coughs> so our speaker tonight uh, is Dr. Jonathan Smith. He's the Chief Diversity Officer of the University, uh, formerly the Special Assistant to the President for Mission, or sorry, for uh, uh, Diversity and Inclusion, which is a mouthful. I can't remember. I was trying to remember. <laughs> um, no, so he served his title a little bit. He's um, still doing awesome work. And he kind of works in the office that um, tries to empower other people to help kind of learn those ideas and uh, make sure that we are committed to university inclusion at the university. Um, so he's going to be our, our speaker tonight, Nagape Latte. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, this is, as you can probably see, it's a pretty informal um, place where we try to get members of this new community. Uh, it's a member this time, but we, we are open to you know, coaches, students, anybody, alumni. Uh, we, get, we get people together to talk about faith in kind of an informal um, format. Hopefully start those conversations that can continue outside this classroom. So, Dr. Smith will be talking about, this talk is called uh, Faith of My Father, so I'll let him take away from here. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and, um, and you can all hear me, right? Yes. All right. Um, if, if I ever reach a point where, it, where you can't hear me, just give me that finger. If I get too loud, do that, because that's <laughs> they're both equally possible. Um, I, also, I want to do uh, what is actually a part of my faith tradition. It's like I'm up here to speak for the evening. I'm the speaker for the evening. Um, but I want to make sure I acknowledge my spouse, partner, my baby mama, my best friend, <laughs> um, my first wife of 32 years, Michelle Smith. <laughs> Well, I, I, I dragged her. I dragged her out tonight because um, I did want her. I did want her to hear this, um, and I want to thank. You, I want to thank you for asking me to do this. Um, so for me, this is just a. It's a wonderful space. One of the things I absolutely love about working at St. Louis University, and it was a thing I actually feared um, before. Before I worked here, all of my education had either been public schools. Uh, my my um, elementary and secondary education had been public school and my undergraduate and graduate education had been in private secular universities. And I was a little bit afraid of working at a Catholic university because I didn't know, I, I, was, just, I was just afraid one of religious institutions, and then I'm not Catholic, and so I, I just wondered, how is this really going to, am I going to be able to be Jonathan in the classroom? Am I gonna be able to speak and teach um, and live the way I wanna live at this institution? And one of the most pleasant surprises for me right away um, because I am a person of faith, and faith is really important to me in my personal life, but it's also been important in the kind of work that I do. And I'll talk. And at some point, you can ask me about you know my kind of academic work. But I found here the thing that was just absolutely liberating to me here is that people in this community, administrators, faculty, staff, and students are unafraid to have conversations about faith in any space that we inhabit. And other institutions, I mean, there's so many places now um, in educational spaces where you can't ask faith questions or have faith discussions in academic spaces. So I'm really happy to work in a place where those are possible, even, if those, even when the, those conversations are difficult or challenging. Um, it's just, I love the fact that it's such an important part of human history and human existence, we don't have to ignore. And I think that puts us in a place to better understand the human condition, um, to better understand who we are, um, why we do the things that we do. And I think um, where, where we miss things in terms of understanding, and I'm about to step in and I know it, uh, where we miss things in terms of understanding who and what Americans are, one of the things we fully miss in, in, in many of our public conversations and in public discourse now is we've lost the ability to fully understand what faith means and how it means in people's lives, you know. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things about last Tuesday when so many people were surprised, um, I think if you just kind of roll back and look at most media, one of the things that's really missing from the conversation, 
among the pundits were people who really understood the faith lives of evangelical Christians in America, black people or otherwise. And perhaps if people had had those sorts of conversations, we would have had a clearer picture of what was going on, um, and fewer of us would have been surprised on last Tuesday. Um, so, but I'll leave that there. I want to tell you that tonight, um, tonight, the, how I want to talk to you, I don't want to talk to you as a chief diversity officer. I don't want to talk to you as an academic. I don't want to talk to you anything, as anything other than a son. Tonight, this is Jonathan Smith, the son of J.C. Smith. Um, when Graham asked me, Graham had asked me earlier in the semester to do this, and I agreed to do this because I just wanted to do it. Um, and I didn't know at the moment that you asked me, Graham, what, what my topic would be. Um, some of you know, over the course of this semester, um, my October was spent um, essentially the first, the first 12, the first 12, the first 11 days of October were spent participating in caring for my dying father. My father died on October 12th of last month, and then the rest of October was spent in the process of doing all of the family planning and all of the necessities to, um, to plan for his funeral, his burial, um, and then to enter the process of grieving in a way for something, and grieving in a way that I've never had to grieve in life. So I wanna to talk to you tonight as the son of J.C. Smith. Um, first thing I'll tell you about my father is that he was a pastor of a church, and that's what, that for me is why he's the center of this conversation. And I think the first thing I'll say, and I think I'd never really thought about this until I thought about doing this, having this conversation. My father is the single most important person in my life in terms of the shaping of my faith and my relationship to my faith. And this might be a little bit surprise to my wife, uh, because in, in so many ways, my mom, even though my dad is a pastor, there's so many ways in which my mother is really the operative spiritual head and lead of our family in the way we lead our lives. So even when my dad was alive and he's a pastor, in the house, it's mom who essentially calls people to pray. It's mom who, you know, brings us to read scripture. So there were many ways in which she was the lead of that. But the, my father, though, is the one who's kind of that pivotal anchor point for me. I am the second of five children, and I'm the oldest son. Um, and why my father is the pivotal one is because early, when I was nine years old, this guy, this is my father started the church, and he was the pastor of a church for 47 years. And one of the things that he repeated constantly throughout my life, throughout his life, and constantly in the pulpit, he said, the society is built on three institutions. He says it's built on the family, the school, and the church. And that for me is like just, I think when I strip everything away, that's probably the single most important faith lesson that has been taught to me in life. And that comes from the mouth of my father. So what I'd like to do tonight is just kind of talk about those three institutions in a relationship to his life and a relationship to faith. Dr. Carnegie told me just at the beginning of this, she said, Jonathan, this might be too soon. And I'm thinking, it might be, but for me right now, this is a thing I need to do um, to share with the community because um, I wish that all of you, I wish that every one of you could have known Reverend J.C. Smith because he was just that amazing. And I'm, I know I'm biased, but I hope by the time you're finished, by the finish with this, you will understand who this guy um, was. So in terms of family, my father was born in 1930 in rural Alabama. So he was born at the, at the cusp, at the beginning of the Great Depression. He was born to a family of sharecroppers, and he was one of 10 children. Just hang your hat on that for a moment. black man, a black boy, born to rural sharecroppers in 1930 at the beginning of the Depression. And my father was the second son. He was the second of those 10 children and the second son. He was named after his father, and my father's name is JC. Doesn't stand for anything. There's no initials there. 
when he's named JC, it's just J, the letter J, and the letter C, not even a period. So JC Smith was born the son of JC Smith. And some, one of the things that my mother tells me about my father's family, because my mother was born in the same area, my mother was born in that same area in 1931, um, and she comes from a family of 16 kids. <laughs> it's, you should have a visceral reaction to that. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, there's something about that that's absolutely insane. And my grandmother, my, my mother, my mother, grandmother raised 15 of those 16 children. And so on my on my father's side of the family, I have about 30 some first cousins. I know all of them, I think. I'm pretty sure I know all of those first cousins. On my mother's side of the family, I have at least 55 first cousins that I know about, and I don't know all of them. A first cousin of mine on my mother's side could walk into this room, and I would not know them <laughs> at all. There are, that, there are that many of them. But that's the world in which they grew up, grew up in. And so my mother tells me about their two families. The Myricks is my mother's family. She said, now, and remember, remember, they are sharecroppers. They are poor sharecroppers during the Depression. My mother tells me, their friends laughed at her family because they were poor. That sharecropping black people will look at my mother's family and say, they ain't got nothing. My father's family, the Hamptons, people talk about them because they were the ugliest family. So my parents, <laughs> that's, 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 you know, I mean, you know how we are, right? Um, and so, and that, those those are who my parents were, and they both grew up in these places where racism was full and real. And if I could tell you the story, you know, it's, this is not the night to talk about my grandfather, but my grandparents would tell me stories about brutal racism that they encountered directly. My grandfather, my grandparents would also tell me about the grandparents they knew who were slaves. And there was a moment when I was talking to my grandparents, and one thing it hit me, it's like when I hugged my grandfather and my grandmother, when I touched them, I was touching somebody who actually touched a slave in this country. And that indicated to me that we are close, right? Things that sound like they're really far away are not as far away as we think they are, right? Because I'm literally, a hand away from someone who was enslaved in this country. That's who my parents are. That's who J.C. Smith was. J.C. Smith also, um, his father died, my, grand, my paternal grandfather died when my father was 15. And when my grandfather died, my father became the person in his family who had to stop school and become the breadwinner for his family. I'm glad I asked him. It's like I didn't ask him this until this summer. At one point, I thought, it finally hit me. I said, Danny, why didn't Uncle Johnny become the breadwinner? Because he's the oldest son, and you're number two. He said, my mother wanted Johnny to take care of the kids. So the oldest boy in this family became the caretaker for the kids, and my father, the second son, was the one who had to drop out of school and do the work of winning bread for his family. Um, and when you run into Dr. Costello, ask him about Dr. Smith's father's hands. I promise you, just ask him that so he can talk to you about that. But my father had, it's like I have big hands, but my father had unnaturally huge hands. <laughs> and when he met Dr. Costello, you know, he had the opportunity to come to my office this summer and he met Dr. Costello. And so, you know, my dad and, and Fred and I and my mom were talking, and my dad was just holding his hand. And we're talking, and then all, out of nowhere, Dr. Costello says, Mr. Smith, your hands are absolutely huge. <laughs> right? And if you, I mean, and you know, Freddie P is a tall guy with big hands. If you've seen him hold the seven plus, it looks like a regular size phone in his hand. <laughs> and my father's hand literally just like engulfed his hand, right? Um, and I knew when he said that that he wasn't making fun of my father's hands because I've known those hands all my life, right? 
Um, and, I, and I felt him do the same thing for me. And, and he asked me, he said, Mr. Smith, how'd your hands get that big? And my father just said, walking behind a mule, holding a plow. So my fa for my father, family is about work, family is about sacrifice. And my father made a very big sacrifice for his <coughs> sisters and brothers that meant that he was unable to go to college. My uncle Johnny went to college, um, eventually moved here and was a cartographer for um, what was, um, what is now will now be the NG, is it the NGA? The, what's it? You, you, yes, the NGA, because it's going to be that big site in North City. And so my, my uncle had an opportunity to go to college. My father did. My father went to the Army, came back from the Army in 1953, and because they were in Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, 1956, my parents got married on June 3rd, 1956, in Montgomery, Alabama, during the middle of the bus, but Montgomery bus boycott which both of them participated in. And the most proud picture, the, most proud, the image of my father that makes me more proud than anything is his mugshot. <laughs> in the middle of 1956, he was arrested for spinning his wheels in a parking lot because he was one of those regular citizens who decided to donate his car and his time and his effort to picking up people who decided not to ride the bus. So when people weren't riding the bus, when black people, when black domestic workers weren't riding the bus, they still needed to get to work somehow. And there was just an army of regular people who took their cars and just transported people. And on one day in 1956, my father was arrested, and there's this picture of him holding his number. His number is 7089. Look for King's mugshot from the same day. King's mugshot is 7084. And they were sequential. And there's and on the Alabama archives of the, the, the state archives website for the state of Alabama, there's a, a part, portion of the site that's dedicated to the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And they have a, a PDF image of the ledger. And I look at that ledger. And the first time I saw that ledger, I was actually teaching a graduate seminar here. And one of my students was doing uh, some work on the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And she put up this image of the ledger. And I looked at it. And I'm sitting there in class, and I was like, that's my father. And the first time I'd seen that, I was a professor here teaching a graduate seminar and totally freaked out and amazed and made proud by the fact that some student was showing an image to show who was involved in the Montgomery bus boycott. And I could say to my graduate students, that dude right there, that's my father. And they're like, for real? I'm like, no, yes, for real. <laughs> I mean, who believes that, right? I mean, Smith's my last name, you know, so it's, um, <laughs> so, but that's, so, but again, that's who my father was, right? Um, that's, who my, that's who my father was, and as a father of five children, um, he raised all five of us um, in a way with these huge hands, these huge, absolutely huge hands in a moment when corporal punishment in so many communities, in particular in black communities, was the, the way you raise children. And I have to tell you, it hit me late in my adult life that I was never afraid of my father's hands. Just never afraid of these hands that were absolutely huge, but amazingly gentle. Why does this, it is an issue for me too. Um, my father uh, occasionally played baseball at our church picnics when we would play softball for the picnic. Dad would never play softball. He'd, just, he'd, he'd come into the game and he'd bat in like the sixth inning. And we always had to let him bat late because we would be out of one of these um, county forest preserves in Cook County. Whenever Dad hit the ball, it was gone. So he would hit it, it would go way out in the weeds and, and people would have to spend time finding the ball. And so I never, I thought this dude couldn't run because <laughs> he hit it so far, and then he'd shuffle around, you know, from first to home. One year, one of the deacons in our church just started talking trash to my dad. And my dad is standing there just taking this trash talk very quietly. And then Roscoe challenged my dad to a race. My dad, I'm 
not until he was like 70, 65 or 70, did my dad own a pair of sneakers. So in order to race Roscoe, because he had on like hard dress shoes, he actually got my sneakers. <laughs> and I'm thinking, JC is about to be really embarrassed by Roscoe. Somebody said, yo, and my father humiliated this dude. Everybody else was amazed. I was absolutely frightened because I thought I was never afraid of his hands, but I always thought if he does try something, I'm 15, I can outrun this dude. And I discovered in that moment <laughs> <laughs> that that was, that was out of, of the question. But this guy who was a fundamentalist evangelical preacher allowed his kids to do theater. It's like we did theater, he let us act in shows, um, be all kinds of characters. He would, he would, we would, we could play any characters. Our characters might cuss on stage. Dad let us do it because it was a part of the show. He never made us miss church um, for being in a show. But that guy was the one who led us all to church. So his approach as the leader of faith in our family, Dad didn't do a whole lot of talking, but he made sure that Saturday night, you know, um, you did some real preparation for Sunday morning. It's like you had to shine your shoes. You you had to make sure everything was ready because on Sunday morning, um, Dad was not dropping us off at church. Because it was walkable sometimes, he would leave us. My father would not wait for us to go to church. His rule was, it's time to get up and go, and you need to be ready, and if you aren't, you're getting left here, but you still better be on time. Right. So his approach to us was that faith was a real discipline. Um, he was the most, he was probably the most faithful and committed human being I know um, in relationship to his family. Um, I'll share this, um, I'll share this, I didn't know exactly when I shared this, I thought maybe I would read this at the end. But this, um, this is what my siblings and I wrote for my dad after he passed. From our earliest days, we knew that you were a great gift from God to us because you showed us in word and deed that you believed in justice. We marched up and down the sidewalk in front of our apartment playing, we want freedom. You modeled consistency and commitment in the way you got up for work every day, had your breakfast of grits, eggs over easy, and coffee no matter the weather or season, and in the way you made us get our baths, shine our shoes, and fresh our church clothes on Saturday nights because you weren't going to play late games with us on Sunday morning. You led us faithfully to Sunday school and church without fail, without excuse. And in this, we learned to seek and love God first. The way you treated mom and the way the two of you laughed and joked with each other taught us how to love our spouses. The way you spoke quietly and gently at home and never cussed, no matter how hard we tried your patience. Patience taught us how to be loving and firm parents. We learned from you that it's just nice to be nice. Now, I promise you, there was a moment where we really, uh, it became a game for us to try to get Dad to cuss. <laughs> uh, and we pushed him to the edge so many times. And one of the, you know, there, there would be moments, um, he did something, and he would say, why in the ham sandwich? Because we got him, we would get him that close, but he would never, I mean, it's just like, within the frame of the family, he was just always that gentle spirit, firm but gentle. Um, one of the things that I learned also, um, watching my father, watching my father die, and watching the relationship between him and my mom as their son, I forgot that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> She's 85. He was 86, and as he was dying. I watched my mother lean over him and say, we were made for each other. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a, thi it's a thing that makes you, because you, you, it's like you don't think about your parents that way, right? It's like, it's like, so as a family person, I thought of my father as dad, and I kept forgetting that his first family in our family was my mother. And so as I watched them, I watched this family man as he, as, he, as he moved from clarity and consciousness to being 
responsive with his eyes and his hands to gradually becoming unresponsive. Every time, every time my mother leaned over and asked that dude for a kiss, his head would move and his lips would pucker up. He never lost that. And for me to watch that was another thing that increased for me and made me feel very special for what lies ahead for me and wife number one. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I got to see him do that. The second institution was school. My father, so, um, and I'm getting yeah, church is the next one. My father um, received an unaccredited, an unaccredited degree from Chicago Baptist Theological Seminary um, when I, as I was growing up. So I had a chance to watch him be something of a college student. That let me know that education was important to him. But what let me know even more, I was about nine years old when my father ran for the first time for, for our local school board, for West Harvey School District, West, West, West Harvey and Dixmore School District number 147. And I thought, I mean, because he's my daddy, I'm like, why is this dude running for school board? I mean, he's not a teacher, he doesn't really think school. So my father ran for the school board and served over 40 years on the school board. My father finally quit the school board when he was like 83. <laughs> that was his commitment to education. Long after every one of his kids, every one of his grandkids had gotten out of elementary school and gone through a school system, this dude still felt it was important for him as a member of the community to serve on the school board and to serve as a president. <coughs> I think one of the things I learned, I think my father is probably the longest serving school board member in the history of the state of Illinois. He was that committed to education, to public education, to the access of public education to the kids in his community. And that for me is a rare thing. Everything that he did, everything that he did that way shaped each one of us to believe, each one of his five children to believe that education was important. So of those, remember those 60 first cousins that I talked about? Of that group of us, there are five of us who have bachelor's degrees. There's me and then my four siblings. Out of 60, so. There are, there are four graduate degrees among those first cousins. All four of those belong to me and my siblings. And here again, I have to have you remember where my parents came from, right? This is the guy who dropped out of school when he was 15 because he had to work. And yet he raised children and still the value of education deeply in each of us so that two of us have degrees from Princeton. So one generation from sharecropper to Ivy League is a large leap. And that doesn't happen. That, for me, does not happen as a matter of my ability. Right? It's a matter of shoulders that I stand on. It's about people who shaped and still who had books everywhere in my house. who didn't do a whole lot of talking, but did a whole lot of walking about education. That's who my father was. As a, as a pastor of the church, that he, the church that he founded, he made sure that education was important to that church. For as long as he pastored that church, which was until um, September 28th, well, no, actually it was until October 12th of this year when he died. So he was an active pastor, but in the pulpit regularly, my father started this thing, you know, and, and even as the church got bigger and there would be a congregation of 500 out there, he'd ask kids to come up, he's like, to find out their GPAs, and if you had A's, he would reach into his pockets. I see you. <laughs> right? You know, and so, and that's a way, even within the community, it wasn't just about his children, it's about the kids who go to church, about whatever their grade level is, whatever their... Whatever their academic track is, my father is like always making the community recognize 
that the school, the education, is a fundamental institution, right? So the church has a very strong Christian education program. The final institution to talk about is the church. And you can hear from everything I say that that's who he was. This is a dude, um, there were moments I really resented him when I was a teenager. Um, well, actually, probably like late, late elementary school through late high school, because we could never go on a vacation that extended beyond two Sundays. My father would only miss one Sunday from his church. And wherever we were on the Sunday that we were away from his church, we'd be in church somewhere else. And again, dad was always leading. So no matter how late we tried to sleep, no matter how much we tried to get out of it, it would be dad who was leading that charge. Dad is the one, um, there's so many, dad is the one who makes, who made me understand um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Um, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. King James Version, that's what I grew up on, right? Um, every day, every day, at every meal, someone would say grace, and everybody else at the table had to recite a Bible verse. And you couldn't just keep recycling. You know, Jesus wept, um, for God's love, the world gave his own, God's son, who should never believe in him, should not perish, and have everlasting life. And so we say that fast, because the faster you said it, the quicker we got to eat. <laughs> um, and it made us look for obscure Bible verses, but it put those things so deep in our spirit and our consciousness that we can't let them go. There's, I believe it's Proverbs 22 and 6, my father would always repeat, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not, he will not depart from him. And that's who my dad, that's who my dad was. And he remained my hero. He remains my hero. He remained my hero every day of his life. Um, this is a dude who had no quit. And I promise you, I am trying to be every bit like him. When my father was 75 years old, I'll tell you a couple more things about him. Um, I'll tell you some hero things, and then I'll tell you maybe one quick story why I was sitting my parents. Um, <laughs> student, when he was 75 years old, 75 years old, one day he's in a parking lot, walking to his car, and he gets hit by an SUV. The car doesn't get hit by an SUV. He gets hit by an SUV, falls over, call the ambulance, and dad says, <laughs> so don't, need, don't need to go with the EMS, don't need to get an x-ray, I'm cool. He gets up and walks it off. <laughs> and never went and got an x-ray. Exactly. <laughs> like, and, and I'm honest, I'm not lying here. This is because we are on the phone like, dude, you need to get an x-ray tomorrow. It's like, even if you didn't go, it's like, you're 75, you need to get stuff checked out because you got hips and knees. And knees. <laughs> <laughs> checked out. But dad was just like, no, I'm cool, I feel fine, so I'm gonna get up and walk it off. Same year, um, my father's getting into his car and somebody, some guy walks up to him with a gun and tries to jack my father's car. So my father gives him the keys, then gets in the car, can't quite get it started. I don't know what, my, I think my dad like snatched the keys, like the dude got out of the car, um, my dad hit him. <laughs> hit him, the dude started running, and my dad chased him. <laughs> chased him, <laughs> fell, scraped his hand, and that was his injury from the car jacket. And he's like, dude. <laughs> 75, no matter how old you are, don't chase the carjacker with the gun. <laughs> yeah, but for me, it's like that for him was a kind of faith, the, the sense of, of not quitting, the hard workingness. And I, one of the last things I told him, you know, as he, went, as he was lying in the hospital, I leaned over and I, you know, I kissed him on the, his bald head and I said, dude, we had some good times, but you worked me too hard. <laughs> He really did. Um, he, he really did. 
Uh, there was one summer in high school, and this is again just a part of the way he kind of shaped me, that helped shape my sense of education, made me just figure out what I want to do with life. Uh, there was a corner store right around from where we lived, Paul's Corner Store, who wanted a new patio, which meant that the old sidewalk had to be broken up. They hired Dad, who, who was, did carpentry, construction, remodeling. So Dad agrees to the job, but then he gives me a 16-pound sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the summer. I'm like 15, 16. Everybody else in my, all the other kids in my neighborhood are on their bikes, riding up to the store, getting tank chips, bicycles. I'm out there all day in the summer with a 16-pound sledgehammer breaking up concrete. And I knew in my heart of hearts, never afraid of Dad, but when JC comes back in eight hours, it better be some sidewalk. <laughs> Broken up. Um, we just had a realtor over our, our house. I learned from my dad. I, told him, I learned how to do almost anything you can do in a house and construction. I learned how to do from my dad. But I promise you, if it needs to be done now, I'm paying somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I've done way too much of it with my dad. Working real hard. Paid me below minimum wage. I had no no social security <laughs> from dad. So he was a horrible employer. He was a great, he was a great co-worker um, and a great dad. And he is my he is my hero. He continues to be my hero. Um, I am I am profoundly thankful to have lived my 56 years with a dad who, who lived to be 86, who the day before he made his hospital right on hospital trip as a pastor of his church taught Bible class. The next day, he goes to the hospital. The only time my father never missed three Sundays in a row at church until he died. When he missed the third Sunday, it was only because there was absolutely no way for him to get where he was to the church. So he, for me, is the dude that makes the, um, I guess I guess I'll stop there and take questions because I just wanted to tell you all about my father, Jesse Smith. were who they were, um, I really didn't mean a whole lot to them. So after I got into Princeton, my father actually pitched to me this, he said, look, you can go away to college, to the school in New Jersey, or you can stay here, go to community college, get a job, and get a car. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you, you and your car. <laughs> Labor for that. Um, so that's so that's who he was. And then um, I was the, I was the kind of kid um, in college. It's like I wanted to make. I was deeply interested in everything, and I wanted to major in everything. So I was calling home every other week. Hey, I'm going to major in English. No, I'm going to major in history. I'm majoring in political science. I'm majoring in. So I went through all of those, and I finally decided on philosophy the first day, the day before classes started, about junior year, which is the absolute latest you can figure out a major. And I had never taken a philosophy course before that either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't do as I do. <laughs> um, and I remember calling home saying, I mean, because it's like, I figured out, I'm majoring in philosophy. <laughs> there was a good seven seconds of silence, and then my dad was like, uh, what kind of job can you get <laughs> with that? Which really deflated me at the moment, but for me it's like, so so the way my parents, it's like, my, I came from a background so that my parents really kind of understood education as, as a direct path to a job that tied to your major, 
Um, and so for the rest of for, for the rest of his life and my academic life, we were on a journey together for them to learn that one, um, everybody don't go to school to become a billionaire poet. I mean, that was my kind of that's my pipe dream, right? <laughs> um, is to be a billionaire poet, but. Um, so, but it was always a journey with them to, to, to understand, like, why is it that somebody would take time? It's like, what's the point of doing philosophy or doing poetry writing or doing literature when you can do something so much more directly vocational, right? And so my father's a much more, was a much more practical, pragmatic man in the way he lived his life than I was. But I could always see over the course of his life, there were moments, it's like, I learned a lot about politics with him and my political orientation was shaped by him. But as, as I, as I developed, you know, learned all of this, like, theoretical, philosophical stuff, I would come home and push him, right? I would push him in terms of gender or sexuality or race and politics. And many times he wouldn't acknowledge me. He, it's like, he'd give me this kind of side eye, but then like about three weeks later, I hear it in the pool. <laughs> you don't have to shout me out, but I hear you. <laughs> so, I have a question about your, your siblings. You know, like, my um, relationship with like, my parents is a lot different than my sister's relationship with my parents. And I was just wondering, how, how do you think your relationship with your parents, especially your father, all five of us are just like deeply, I mean, we are, um, we actually talk about ourselves as Claire rather than family. Um, last year, uh, when I was 55, was the first year, first Christmas in my life that I was actually not in the physical presence of my father. And so our family has this long tradition, you know, and it's been some, you know, in, in our recent past, it's been some really difficult moments with me and my siblings, but for all of us in relationship to our parents, that thing has remained completely um, unbroken um, and, 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 and fully, you know, fully intact. I've learned, um, I've learned better in this late stage of my father's life, and as my mother is going through this process now, um, that my parents understand each of us differently. So it's like when my mother calls me to ask for stuff, she calls to ask me for things that she, or to do things that she doesn't call my sister or my other brothers for. She tells me things that she doesn't tell them. And I'm sure she tells them she has conversations with the others. So each of our relationships I know now is like very particular and individual, and I absolutely love that. Um, and my parents, I think, you know, it's, and it's and a lot of it's in hindsight, you know, that I discovered you know, things I didn't appreciate about my parents when I was 10 or 15 or 30 or 40, every, every year, every day with them gives me a, a better understanding of how they loved us and how they paid very particular individual attention to each of us. I mean, Jonathan, I appreciate your willingness to um, share I mean, right after you really kind of let us in. Um, for me, then, thinking about you as a father, what poignancy, what, what did you learn from your dad that just is second nature in, in your role as a dad? Uh, to listen, to, re to really listen. We used to, my father used to irritate the hell out of us when we would ask him for stuff, right? It's like, if we wanted to go to a game on Friday night, it's like, Learned we had to start asking that dude on Monday morning. He'd be shaving. He'd be like, Dad, can we go to the football game on Friday night? Um, and then we'd walk away because we knew there's just absolutely no way you're going to get an answer from Dad then. You knew that he heard you, but he was not going to, he never gave us a thoughtless <coughs> response. And, and here again, I had to figure this out recently too. It's like over the course of the week, as we at, we would ask him a little bit more every day, but our ask would would get more refined. It's like, can we go to can we go to the football game? Art and Arlene are going with us, and Art's gonna drive. And so over the course of the week, we got more refined ask. We do more of our own problem solving, and by the time he finally said yes, we had a robust question with real solutions in it, as opposed to. Can I go to the 
go to the football game. <laughs> so, so I do, I do, I do a lot of that with my children, and I learn from my dad also to just be, just be gentle. It's like my, if you met my mother, you think my mother was absolutely just wonderful, fine, and gentle. But this is a woman who would possibly fight you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to push it, but she would possibly fight you. But my dad, my father, was just the most gentle person. And Rochelle has stories. It's just like, it's like my dad was just there. Um, one of the things that I told my siblings and my mother as my father was dying, my father was just always there to help. And if he thought we needed anything, he was going to give it. And at the end of his life, the thing that I the last, one of the last things I was asking for him as I held his hand was just for him to hold it and squeeze it. And he would do that. You know, even as he slipped out of consciousness, right? We would ask, Dad knew that we wanted something from him. And as long as he thought we wanted something from him, he was there to give it. And that's how I want to treat my daughters, right? Um, and, and, to, and to walk with them. Um, my father also walked with us through whoever it is that we were. Um, I am really, of my, of my siblings, I'm really the oddball sibling in a ton of ways. Um, but my father never requested me to be anything other than who I am. And for me, um, that has been amplified. Uh, and he was willing to change, too. So my father, as a preacher, um, went through this period, like his typical kind of black church period. He didn't believe women had a place in the pulpit. So... When we were growing up, if women were speaking at the church, they would have to, they couldn't stand in the pulpit area. They had to stand on the floor. No women ministers. Um, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, my sister was called to preach. And her big question was like, who's going to tell Dad? <laughs> because Dad was not for that. But when Jennifer was called to preach, Dad had an epiphany. And because he knew he was willing to change, and it changed the structure, it changed the culture at the church. And so and that for me is a thing I also want to carry from, from my father, because our daughters have walked paths that when we um, were growing up would not have been acceptable paths. And we've had to learn how to follow them and accept them and love them and be supportive of them, even when they are, you know. And we've done that at some extent with other family relationships, but I know my father, I'm sorry, just a, my father is like that about us. So he, his, his last living brother, Suge, dad loves Suge more than, I mean, Suge is clearly his favorite sibling. There was one moment, another uncle was, had passed, and the Christmas clan, <coughs> which is his children, spouses, grandchildren, were in my dad's house, and there's about 20 of us. Suge came also, and Suge loves to stay with dad. My dad was like, you know, Suge, you and Doc, who's his sister, he's like, I love you all, but this group right here is here, and y'all gonna have to go stay at a hotel. And when I saw him kick Suge out of the house, <laughs> I was like, dude, you really do feel special about us, and that's what I want to do with my children. Forget my long answers. <laughs> And I was talking about it with people, you know, when, um, at my father's funeral and through all those ceremonies. I was like, this is exactly the kind of place that dad has raised me up to be in. So before my father died, I knew that there was a relationship in this place between school and church. I'm like, this is where I am. But then when my father died, the way students, staff, colleagues, and Administrators, um, Father Chris, Father Chris showed up at my dad's wake. You know, Dr. Costello and Dr. Porterfield came, and I'm like thinking, this is so crazy. Um, Reverend Sekou showed up. You know who Reverend Sekou is? <coughs> Reverend Sekou showed up at my father's funeral, and in that moment, I thought, here are all these people that I thought were either friends, associates, and colleagues. 
who felt a way about me and my family and showed up like family. And I thought, okay, now I'm like really cool to be right here now because I know the people that I work with, I know that y'all, that we are family, we are education, and we are spirit. Thank you.